There we go. Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Augustine, and I'm the Archivist and Oral History Coordinator at White Spog Preservation Trust. Thank you all so much for joining us on this really beautiful evening. Happy almost spring and happy full moon. So we are joined tonight by Bill Bolger, who is a former National Parks historian and also White Spog historian, really. He did a lot of work on the 1982 National Register project for White Spog, and he's going to be talking to us about that tonight. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Bill. Very good. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm getting the message about recording, and I don't have control of my mouse to say okay. So I, you see that I'm showing the meeting as being recorded, Son? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm trying to eliminate that. Hmm. Okay, I'll do it this way. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. And okay, ready to go? Yes. All right, everyone should know that this is my maiden voyage as a uh, Zoom speaker. I've been on more Zooms than I can count over the last two years, but um, Sarah reassured me that she could actually teach an old dog a new trick. So we'll see. Um, so the, this talk is Defining White Spog, the 1982 National Register of Historic Places study. Uh, it's 40 years, and I was part of a team that undertook a, a study of White Spog to place, uh, to identify what the resource is and to place it on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and it was a pleasure. It was, I'd been familiar with it for a few years, but diving into it in depth and <clears throat> going through records and investigating virtually every corner of the place, 2,000 acres was, was one of the great treats of my life. Um, I noticed that a lot of talks now begin by acknowledging the, the native group whose land we are on. And I think this is especially appropriate at Whitesburg because we know that the main run of cranberries, uh, cranberry bogs at Whitesburg, uh, which was laid out along a stream called Cranberry Run, that that cranberry run was actually one of the largest naturally occurring uh, cranberry bogs in the region. And it was used by uh, natives and then later settlers before it became, if you will, privatized into a farm operation. So you can assume that Native Americans were harvesting cranberries on that very land for literally thousands of years. And I think that's really moving. When I walk there, I often think about the depth of that. So the backstory to the nomination, uh, I subtitle to nominate or not to nominate. Uh, main point here being that it was not a given that this would be nominated to the National Register. Uh, the, the land, the 3,000 acres had been sold by J.J. White Incorporated to the state of New Jersey in 1967 using green acre funds. And the state was not interested in dealing with historic uh, recognition and managing historic resources. And they had actually proceeded to destroy some of the buildings there. There was a standing joke at least years ago about those who could say, smiling that uh, they were around, they could remember when Rome burned. Rome is one of the workers' villages. And it was burned by state managers <clears throat> shortly after the uh, land was acquired. So there was very, very strong opposition to the point where it probably would not have been nominated if it hadn't been for the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. And specifically uh, their director at the time, David F. Moore, um, who made it happen. He, he procured the funds and determined that this needed to be done. And, uh, and because it was public land, he had the right to do that. Uh, so, so he proceeded with uh, organizing and conducting the study. Uh, Dave's there on, a, on the left with his wife, Mary, 
And then on the right, you see Michelle Byers, who just retired as the New Jersey Conservation Foundation director after many years. But at Whitesburg, she was living at Whitesburg, and this was her entry position. Uh, and I have to say that both of these people really understood the relationship between history and nature, which is something that I've realized over the years a lot of people do not. You know, they're like the history people, and then they're the nature people. And it's, it's wonderful for me to have worked with people, especially that early on in my career, who saw the obvious integration and the, and the importance of understanding the human role in the environment, which Weitzbach is just a spectacular example of. The Conservation Foundation hired um, a group out of North Jersey called Historic Conservation and Interpretation uh, Incorporated. This was the uh, cultural resources organization uh, that Ed Rutch had started. Ed, Ed was a noted archeologist and really a founder of industrial archeology span and its study in certainly in New Jersey. And really he had, I think a national reputation. Uh, this is a field that had only emerged in the early 1970s. And Ed was uh, famous already because he had uh, among other things uh, discovered the and, and presented the significance of Patterson Archeological District up in the North part of the state. And he was focusing exclusively by 1982 on industry. And his first response when we approached him to, to participate was that uh, this was agricultural. He wasn't interested in something that wasn't industrial. And we explained the history as we knew it at that stage and convinced him that this is actually a, a agricultural industry, that the dialectic, the old Jeffersonian dialectic of agriculture versus industry uh, was no longer a relevant um, dialectic. It, it, agriculture in this country has proceeded for many years on its ability to innovate and advance with technology <clears throat> and the engineering. So he agreed and I think he, he found it you know, fully appropriate for his, his interest and used it a lot in his later lectures. Herb Giffens was the architect, a wonderfully talented man, uh, both in his architectural restoration skills and his graphic representations. Uh, and then me, the historian. Here's Ed, uh, the industrial archeologist. Tragically, we, we lost him in 2003. This is a great picture of him because it's very characteristic of the way he would sit and look and think about things. Um, he was a delight to work with. I could talk about him for ages and I don't have the time tonight. <clears throat> so here's the study area. Those of you who like Google Earth, uh, and I'm assuming a, a lot of you are very familiar with this site already. So you'll recognize the, the aerial view characteristics of the place. Uh, you, you've got, um, oops. And again, I don't have use of my mouse. Huh, that's a little strange because I'd like to uh, be able to point things out. Um, okay, there is a mouse here that I can use maybe if I can get to it. Oh, well. Okay, I'll try to do it verbally. Excuse me. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> at the north, you see Range Road and Boundary Road and, and the uh, firing ranges at Fort Dix. And at the south, you see Route 70. And the, the study area is almost everything between those two roads, uh, including a little bit south of 70, the reservoir that you see there, uh, which is the Pole Bridge Branch Reservoir. And this is about a 2000 acre uh, area, uh, which when you get to covering it on foot and inch by inch, it's, it's quite, a, quite a resource to cover. Um, 
But you see here, the main bogs, that big run of fairly large bogs with the upper reservoir on the right side, those are the bogs developed by J.J. White. <clears throat> What's interesting about this view to me is that down below, below 70, you see new bogs. These were developed by J.J. White Incorporated in the 1960s. And it, 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 this is an aside, but it's a wonderful illustration of the difference in cranberry technology between the early harvesting method and the water harvesting, uh, because those lower, lower bogs were designed specifically for water harvesting. Um, and they're privately owned and were only about five years old or, or no, 10, 15 years old when we did the study. So there was no question that those were outside the, the study area. Okay. And now I have totally lost control of the screen. Uh, I'm going to escape again. Okay, well. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I'm still getting that extra bar below, which is making it difficult for me to see the see the screen. Okay, well, I know what's on the screen. I hope can you all see it, or are you seeing the interference of the toolbar? I can see it good. You can see the full screen. Yep. Okay. So, what I'd like to know is how many of you are familiar with National Register nominations, the process and what's involved in it, because I don't want to repeat too much that you already know. If you could indicate in the control bar uh, if you are familiar with it, then I can know how many of you are familiar with it. So if you could go ahead and do that now. Under reactions, do you see the uh, menu where you can go to reactions and indicate? <clears throat> We've had two thumbs up so far. And I see- Dave you is not familiar with the process. There's a few saying that they're not familiar. Okay, so I'll give a brief intro. I see you can also do a crying icon. <laughs> so. Some of us who have worked with the National Register might want to do the crying icon. <clears throat> the, um, oh, not again. Okay, so the main tasks, there are four main tasks in developing a nomination. Uh, the first is to identify the areas of significance, the history, what, what is important in what happened at the site. And the second is to identify the physical resources associated with that significant history. Uh, the National Register, first and foremost, is a material culture program that has to identify tangible physical evidence that has integrity relative to the significant area. Uh, the third is to determine an appropriate boundary that describes the resource. This was a big deal at Whitesburg because it was such a huge boundary. And this can often get very complicated. It's very important because it, it sets the legal limits of what is recognized officially by the federal government as significant. And the fourth one is to cite legitimate primary and secondary documentation sources. Uh, that is to show your basis and make sure that it's clear that you didn't make it up or uh, derive it from unreliable sources. In the significance area, the National Register lays out four uh, criteria. A is basically events, events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. B are people that are significant in our past. C is a resource that characterizes a type, period, or method of construction. And D are sites that have yielded or may be likely to yield important information. If 
the National Register was a pinball machine, we would have lit up a lot of lights with this nomination. Uh, we qualified for A, B, and C. And I felt very strongly that we qualified for D, but for some technical reasons, and I think corporate culture, <clears throat> they wouldn't consider it for D. But I think it really qualifies under all, all four, but it, it was officially recognized under A, B, and C. And, uh, and uh, with great strength, I might add. A lot of you are, I'm sure, familiar with the, the main narrative, the famous people, uh, the key people in the history of the site, but I'll just list them quickly. Uh, James Fenwick, who was the pioneer cranberry grower. Uh, and then his son-in-law, Joseph White, who comes in in the 1880s. He's already a nationally recognized figure as the author of the state-of-the-art book that uh, described the methods for cranberry agriculture. And then, of course, his daughter, Elizabeth Coleman White, who was the uh, co-developer of the highbush blueberry crop and also just integrally involved in all sorts of aspects of life at White's Bob. So those are the three heavy hitters that uh, clearly qualify it uh, for persons. And, and then we have Tom uh, Darlington, who, uh, and if you remove the images on the side of the screen, you can see that this photograph. Uh, Tom was the current manager of JJ White at the time that I did the study and was just a wonderful resource and person to get to know. Uh, amazing man. He was an aeronautical engineer, a PhD in psychology, and then was drafted to become the uh, family's head of the, the operation at Whitesburg. Uh, he went on to invent two major machines, the dry harvesting machine that allowed cranberries to be harvested without flooding them, uh, which has its own significance. And it, some people are still using that machine to this day. And then he also invented a blueberry harvesting machine as well as other equipment that he used regularly around the farm. Uh, so Tom was a very important figure. He was a founding Pinelands Commissioner member and served on that commission for 20 years. Uh, but he was my source and, and I was able to get a lot of information through direct interviews, as well as the fact that he provided me with the company records, uh, very generously shared those. And that gave us everything we needed to know to answer almost any question we had about the uh, history of White Spot. The, the little miniature image on the right which I find quite charming. I, I just found that today. I went online to find a, a photo of Tom. And what I came up with was this uh, infant miniature, uh, which was identified as Thomas B. Darlington, 1926. And it was in an exhibit. And I guess it's in the collection of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. But I I just love that image. It's an odd thing to show a, an infant image regarding a mature professional with a long career, but I, it, it just seemed to be something that I, I thought would be worth uh, showing tonight. So with Tom's information, and he brought out, when I first went in there to his office, he brought out a uh, carton packed with documents, including a, a diary of the bog building episodes by J.J. White. And so this whole question of, well, when were these bogs built and so forth was answered beyond any, any question whatsoever. This map shows, this was done by Herb Giffens, the architect, and it shows the overall layout of White's bog and gives you the, the basic structure, including uh, the numbered areas are cranberry bogs, the lettered uh, areas are blueberry fields, the toad, uh, toned areas, the dark tone areas are the reservoirs, the heavy double lines are the uh, canals. And 
I'll have more to say about that in a second. But but this structure outlined with everything, with with showing the relationship of all the bogs, both the ancillary bogs along Antrim's branch, the, the use of Gaunt's up on the upper right, you see Gaunt's Brook Reservoir, where J.J. White um, dammed a, a brook to the north and brought the water into, into the upper reservoir. This shows the full extent of the structure. And I emphasize the word structure that J.J. White developed over his tenure, which was about a 50 year period. And at the time, the National Register was not very inclined to list farmland. They didn't think land was important historically. It's something that they've gotten over since, but at this time, they basically, if this had been a wheat farm or something, they would have refused to include the fields. The reason they included this is that the register explicitly recognizes buildings and structures. And so we made the case that at least a 1500 acre area was a structure, that it was built just like any structure and that it had a highly sophisticated function uh, like a brilliantly thought out structure and that it was all there. And so that pretty much ended any question. The, but the other thing we were able to answer was uh, within a year or two anyway of the construction of each bog. This, this shows the water handling system. And what this really shows is that White's bog is a big plumbing device. It incorporates four different streams that can be, have the water switched between them back and forth, up and down. <clears throat> you can reverse the flow up the watershed <clears throat> and, and most cr critically across the watershed. So the Gaunt's Brook can feed into the Cranberry um, Run, which can also be diverted across into Antrim Branch or down into Pole Bridge. And this was absolutely critical because you're at the extreme height of the watershed here. There is maybe a mile, maybe at most two miles further up of watershed before you get to the divide going over into the Atlantic Ocean. <clears throat> so your water resources are limited, much more limited than you'd be uh, 10 miles down the stream. And in fact, when JJ set out to expand his father-in-law's farm, people called it White's Folly. They said uh, that he was gonna fail because they, and these were the growers, you know, they, they were looking at him and thinking, he can't do that. He's too far up on the watershed. He's not gonna have enough water to flood the bogs and protect them in the winter, which was critical to their cultivation. And they called it White's Folly. What they didn't know was that J.J. White was a natural born engineer, <clears throat> both mechanical and civil. And so he designed this canal system that uh, simply brought these four branches together and together they could be traded back and forth and provide a considerable amount of water wherever he wanted it. And he succeeded very nicely. There, some of the extreme bogs didn't fare well, I think, and he, he gave up on them. I'm not sure that Antrim's branch was ever very successful, uh, but that was relatively minor to his overall vision and undertaking. This is a another map that Herb Giffens did that that you know graphically represents this water mechanism. Uh, I think very very well. Just a side note, by the way, another little bit of the prehistory before the cultivation of cranberries. You see Hanover Furnace site up in the upper left corner. Uh, there was a canal dug from Pole Bridge Branch all the way over to um, all the way over to Hanover Furnace to supply the furnace with extra water. So that process of moving water had begun. J.J. White quadrupled the whole system uh, considerably and, and went much further up the watershed with it. 
One of the things that charmed me the most about the records that we found at the J.J. White office was that every one of these bogs has a name. So if anybody thought that it was a little too vague to, to list 41 bogs, um, not only could we tell them when they were built, and most of them have a specific year, or at least a, period, a window of two to three years in which they were built, but they have names and the names range from geographic location names like Middle Antrim's Branch to the varieties that were being grown in them, which is useful information as well. The Upper Mead, the Lower Haddon, Old Howe, these are cranberry varieties at the time and uh, clearly being uh, specialized in each of those bogs. Um, but I think it's the names to me that really give them a, an identity and a, a personality. The, uh, there's even a Billy Bog, a John Bog. I don't know who they were, um, but, and of course it makes perfect sense that you would have to name the Bogs in order to let people know um, where to go to work, you know, which Bog are we gonna harvest today? Well, we're gonna go to Lower Pole Bridge or we're gonna go to Little Meadow and everybody would know where to head. The other part of the survey is uh, the village, which was considerable part of the survey in its own right. I mean, there's 26 buildings that we had to study, quite varied buildings from a filter house for the water system to a packing house, to large residences for the family members, to small workers' houses. And um, we, we did a... Um, Pretty handy job summarizing those buildings and investigating them. My favorite, of course, may it rest in peace, is the packing house. Uh, the, the packing house is uh, seen here on the right, a view of the full packing house as it once existed, but the section nearest us in that view that stretches back to the, to the firewall uh, was the section that still existed in 1982 and for some time after, and was part of the uh, storage part of the, of the facility. There was a uh, cleaning and packing operation in the, in the middle section, and, and then there were these two flanking storage sections. And each of those storage sections, the one that was there in 1982, was 200 feet long. I mean, these were by far the largest agricultural buildings in the pine barrens. And they were fascinating because, the, of course, the, the uh, cleaning and storage building originally held the machinery that J.J. White had developed uh, for cleaning the, the berries. Uh, and there are some surviving pieces and examples of his machinery. Uh, but the, the storage building was also a machine you can see that there are slatted floor levels, which permitted air to rise through the building when you open the side panels. And so the whole secret of this was to uh, keep the fruit from freezing or getting rotted by moisture. <clears throat> and so you wanted airflow that would uh, allow warm air in when it was available and also dry air. And the air would rise through the building by convection and out the monitor roof at the top. It was a brilliant, simple, wonderful design, and we lost this, unfortunately. But we did have a chance to uh, document it in 1982. So that's pretty much the study. Uh, we submitted it in 1982. It took six years for everybody to get used to the idea of submitting it for final approval in Washington. There were never any revisions, never any, any criticism. It was a very uh, substantial case that was made. And it did eventually get listed on the National Register in 1988. Uh, and it became the stimulus for starting a Whitesbog Trust and setting out to do what we could to preserve the resources of Whitesbog. 20 years later, I was working with the Park, National Park Service and the new, newly formed group called the Cultural Resources 
uh, Geographic Information System Lab was formed to document historic landscapes. Uh, they, they were using, they were able to make use of the newly released uh, uh, GPS technology, uh, Global Positioning System, to do inventories on a large scale that would have been uh, prohibitively expensive using conventional survey means. And most of the sites that they had done up to in the few years prior to 2002 uh, were battlefields. And we invited them to Whitesburg and they jumped at the opportunity because they loved the difference in the kind of resource. It, it gave them uh, a lot to think about and a, and a lot to demonstrate in terms of their own abilities. And, and it gave them a chance to work with the Historic American Landscape Survey, which was a new office of the Park Service that was added to the Historic Building Survey and the Historic Engineering Survey. And all three of them worked, actually collaborated with the lead being the Historic uh, Landscape Survey. Uh, so you had the Park Service coming in and doing studies directly of, of this uh, district and producing electronic data, which is still available. And what I'm working on now is, is to uh, make it available using modern software. At the time that this study was done, it was, uh, and we have a cat passing in front of me at this point. Sorry about that. Um, the, you might as well say hello. There he is, cat saying hello. Um, the point being that, that this map is, is now going to be available soon, I hope, <clears throat> using software that's much more user-friendly than it would have been in 2002. <clears throat> you can see the, the features that they were able to document. It's virtually anything related to the history of the farm, uh, sluice gates, bridges, structures, archeological sites, water facilities, ditches, canals, dams, trails, roads, major roads, major waterways, reservoirs, and bogs. And it's all in there. And of course, it's in there at a remarkably uh, large scale, or is it small scale? I always get that confused. Um, in other words, within a few inches, locating any of these features. And, and the most exciting part of this to me um, if it's implemented and available is that it can, it can be a living map that allows for documenting changes over time. It can also take data levels, uh, layers that would indicate recreational uses, uh, and, as well as the location for rare and endangered species, any number of things that could be added to this uh, to be used by site managers to better understand white fog and to uh, allocate resources. So I'm very excited about this and I can't believe it was 20 years ago that this was undertaken, but I do believe it is going to be useful in the near future. I'll finish by just acknowledging <clears throat> that this 40 year old domination uh, has a need for changes, additions and corrections. There a few minor mistakes, and I think only minor mistakes, but mainly things that we overlook. For instance, those of you who know the village area well know that there's the triangle test field. This was the second blueberry test field in the world. And we didn't even know about it at the time of the study. So that's not included in the inventory of blueberry fields. Uh, we didn't fully understand the structure of Elizabeth White's garden. And you, you could do a whole addendum on that. Uh, but then there are other areas that, remember I was saying that criteria B, the ability to yield information uh, should be one of the criteria that the Whitesburg is recognized for. Because since we did that study, we've been learning a tremendous amount about the workers community and many other aspects of the operation that we didn't know. We didn't even know there was an African-American community living in Rome by the 1940s. 1940s was a little bit out of the study area, 
but nobody mentioned it either. And then later we learned that there were, and that many of the family uh, families live in close proximity and are wonderful informants about life in White Spot. The Italian workers uh, that came from Philadelphia, we, we've been able to interview many of them. And so we learned a huge amount about those workers' communities, just, just to point out uh, one, one area. But then one of my favorite areas is landscape design. In 1982, the only designed landscapes that were really being considered for the National Register were the ones designed by people like Frederick Law Olmsted as parks, you know, Central Park, yeah, well, that, that was a landscape, okay. But I think it's now more broad in its appreciation. And so a landscape like Whitesburg that was developed as a farm, to me is an outstanding landscape. In fact, if JJ White had set out to simply develop a garden, he couldn't have done a better job in my opinion. I, I just always marvel at the beauty of the White Spog landscape. So it's functional, it's, it's a derivative of, of farming activity, but it is what it is. It's one of the most spectacular landscapes I know of. And then these intimate little scenes, and of course how it changes during the seasons. I mean, this looks like pre-Raphaelite paintings to me. It, it's just so rich in the vegetation and these water courses that, that run throughout it, just to me make it a, a, one of the great environments of all time. And not that you're gonna be able to copy these, I suppose, but uh, the, the National Register form is available online. It's a tough read because the form itself is so boring, but um, we're gonna do a version of it. And with uh, the graphics that Herb Giffens did and make it available so that uh, people can really um, appreciate what, what's in that nomination. Uh, and then the link to the Historic American Landscape Survey that was done in 2002, that's online now with the Library of Congress. You see the LOC, dot gov address um, and that that's a spectacular uh, effort I mean, they, they really collected a lot of photographs as well as map data and uh, that's what we're hoping to make better use of but that is uh, online as well so that about concludes my little tour of the nomination so if there are questions I'd be glad to take them. So if you have a question or any comments, you can either put them into the chat and I'll read them off, or you can unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Hi, I've got a question. Can you hear me? I do. Uh, fascinating presentation. And um, I'm calling from uh, New York with Ann Rothstein Segan, whose father photographed uh, extensively in White Spog in the 1930s. And um, I'm very curious to know did, did the, uh, did it, was there much of the uh, Rome and Florence structure? remaining at the time you did the initial study in the 80s or in 2002? There were, there were no standing structures, unfortunately. Rome had been burned sometime prior. I'm not sure when Florence uh, went down, uh, but we did identify it as potential archeological site. And there are some ruins uh, in those areas. We, we certainly knew where they were. We identified the locations and we included photographs that had been taken, wonderful photographs showing the buildings that had been there. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, we'd be very interested in trying to place some of the, some of uh, Arthur Rothstein's uh, photographs, um, but that would be challenging if in the absence of any of those buildings, to the extent those pictures are in Roman Florence. So these are photos that you have in your possession? Uh, they're at the Library of Congress. 
and and we have some as well. Um, he was working for the Farm Security Administration and kind of following in the footsteps of uh, of uh, Lewis Hind, who had been there. 25 years earlier and uh we yeah we, we've done some talks about his photography there from was it 1938 39 yeah, he was there yeah he, he visited a lot of areas in central new jersey but spent a considerable time at uh, at white's bog and he he was working for uh, for the federal farm security administration um I so i think so I think the interest, I think his interest was multifaceted. I think he was following in the footsteps of a similar tour that had been done by Lewis Hine in the early 20th century related, I think during his time working for the child labor committee. Right. Um, and it was very interesting to see that White's Bog, had, although it had a lot of child labor there, it was considered sort of one of the more benevolent places for child labor, perhaps in relation to some of the others that were existent at that time. Um, that, that was a, a fascinating uh, component of the study, the, the issue of child labor, uh, which of course generally opposed to having children in mills and all, and yet uh, Elizabeth White defended it. <laughs> she said that, that, that families wanted to stick together and these were agricultural families, mostly at least in the initial period from uh, Sicily. And they were used to working together in the field. And so her point was, they're happy together in the field. And she even joked that the kids destroyed more berries than they picked. Uh, so that didn't amuse the officials though very much. And soon after that, the children had to be removed from the, the bogs and put in a school. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting chapter. And I was greatly relieved to find because you never want to do a study and find that you're studying evil people <laughs> who did terrible things. And White's Bog actually emerges as, as the example that they held up, uh, for instance, with, with migrant housing. And it's fascinating to see what they considered to be model housing. But of course, the, these units were only used for two or three months a year. And, and they point out that uh, having units for each family so that there aren't strangers living with family members, uh, having rooms that you could stand up in, having screens on the window, and having a clean source of water and, and proper disposal of sewage were, were the key elements that they pointed to. And they said that those were all present at White Spot, which of course by implication meant that they were not present uh, throughout the the region. Right. That was state of the art worker, seasonal worker housing for the time, I think. It, and it evolved. The, the Rome buildings were uh, older and a little, little cruder. The, white, the, the uh, Florence buildings uh, really were models. They, they were uh, eight units in a block, one room down, one room up. So you had four units on each side of the block, with each with their own door, each with windows, high enough ceilings <coughs> to stand up in. So yeah, that and then they would cook outside, and and they had their uh, water and sewage outside. So the the two rooms were for the family, and uh, for basically for sleeping and uh, privacy, and uh, yeah, it was considered the model, and it. Unfortunately, it was never lived up to by many of the farms. It was a touchy issue here, even with when I was doing my study, uh, with some of the living conditions that they had. Yeah, it was very interesting to see the evolution of the thinking. Uh, Lewis Hines' stories about, you know, know who picks your cranberries was a bit sensationalized about the child labor aspects of it. And, but I think Arthur Rothstein really did a, made a serious effort. He, he was the seasoned documentary photographer by this time, and he made a real serious effort to carefully document the living conditions, the cooking facilities, the bathroom and water facilities for the workers, and made extensive notes about their working conditions, which were, you know, was, as you say, it was not all bad. It was kind of a 
family situation and the, done in the in the in a manner that had traditionally been done for many years there and perhaps in Sicily and other places as well. Sarah, are you familiar with this collection? I am. I actually attended their talk. I think it was about this time last year. Yeah. And I did my thesis on child labor. So. <laughs> uh -huh. you go. So you have all the information on, on this collection and you have the, uh, about the notes that he took on the conditions at White Spot? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll share yeah, that with you. And it's been, um, they had done a, a rather poor job of digitizing the photo collection at the Library of Congress in the 90s, I think. And now they're doing a fantastic job of re-digitizing re everything to very high standards. So it's becoming kind of newly available in, its, in, its, uh, in the state in which it was initially photographed. They're going back to the original negatives and scanning them very well. And, and the photographs are quite, quite good um, in terms of documenting the details of life and work at the bog and in other places in central, other workplaces in central New Jersey. So it's a, it's an emerging resource, I think, and it's uh, with its new digitization that's going on now. Well, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay, I see a few questions in the chat. Um... How did Native Americans harvest the cranberries? They would have picked them by hand. Uh, the normal way to harvest cranberries is by picking. And of course that was done by the migrant workers. It was done up until the twenties when the cranberry rakes were employed uh, for expedience sake when labor was harder to get. Uh, but the ideal way is to get in there and pick them by hand. And, and I'm assuming the, the natives would have done the same thing. And of course they use them as a mix and pemmican uh, in, in the fall as a source of uh, vitamin C, not that they would have been aware of what vitamin C was particularly, but they knew it was good for them. And so they'd mix it with the animal fat and the dried meat and, and make a, a food that they could keep through the winter. Um, and speaking of, of hand harvesting, I, I had the a wonderful experience of meeting a woman who had hand harvested back in the early 20th century. I thought we were too late for that, but uh, she told me in detail what it was like and how it would uh, crack your hands and you would have to use brine to harden, harden the, uh, the skin, which of course would have been painful. Uh, it was very moving to hear the reality of what a hand picking operation would have been like. The, uh, typically it would take, you know, JJ White developed about 600 acres of cranberry bogs and it would typically take a, a, a harvester about a, a two to three month period to harvest one acre. So that's how labor intensive it was. They had about 600 people coming there in the fall and living and hand picking from you know the 1890s on. Dennis is asking, did you do the survey before or after your Smithville book? After, after. Smithville was 1978, uh, published in 1980, and then I went off on my own and uh, was working as a freelance uh, historic preservation person. Uh, did studies at Medford, Medford Historic Village, uh, Southampton, Vincent Town. Uh, started one on uh, Pemberton. Did a study of the uh, uh, the paintworks at Gibbsboro, the, the famous uh, John Lucas paintworks. Uh, but then this came along, and I was delighted. It was uh, my favorite. Of, uh, I think probably my favorite of anything that I ever studied because it just brings together so many things that I love, including a very strong nature component and this whole history of how people have worked the environment and made it, uh, made it work for them and sort of come to peace with it really because the story of course starts out with some pretty violent harvesting of timber and iron and, and then moves into this period of uh, 
cultivating cranberries. You know, I need to plug my computer in. I thought I had enough battery. Uh, <laughs> Maybe over, but can I just run and get the plug? Sure. Okay. All right, so in the meantime, if you have any other questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Oop, I think we lost him. All right, we'll just give Bill a few minutes. Do you have any upcoming events you can tell us about while we're waiting? I do. So tomorrow night at, I believe, 7, I will double check, we have our full moon hike. That happens every month on the Saturday closest to the full moon. I'm just pulling up our event page now to confirm the time. Um... Yes, 7 p.m. is the Moonlight Hike tomorrow at White's Bog. Um, we also have a seed swap happening tomorrow at 10 a.m. And that's sponsored by our Pines Education Program. So you can just come out, learn about gardening, exchange some seeds, pick up some things for your garden. Um, we are also starting our Blueberry Music Jams again on Sunday. That starts at 11 a.m. Um, it's an open jam, all acoustic, so if you have an instrument, feel free to come out. I think it's going to be another beautiful day. Um, and for the Harvesting Story Speaker Series, we have our final speaker coming up on April 1st at 6 p.m., and that will be Greg Fizzy, who will be talking about some Lenny Lenape oral histories. And also, I know most of you are members, but if any of you are not members, um, we're always looking for new members, and it really, really supports the work that we do in Bill Bolger's In the Waiting Room. But it is $20 to be a new member, and then it goes up from there. You can be anything from $35 all the way up to as much as you can give. Hi, I'm back. I'm sorry, I just connected Hello. when I left. <laughs> So you do have two more questions. Are the maps you displayed available? Well, we can make them available. <laughs> it's a and work I, in progress. <laughs> well, and like I said, I, Sarah and I have been talking about this. Uh, what I'd like to do is to get the the report uh, and, and the report minus the nomination form, which I've always found very unfriendly. Uh, but the text of the of the report, together with these wonderful illustrations, uh, online, so people can access it directly. Uh, if if you go to the uh, website for the National Register, you'll find the form, and I and I really have to say it, it's one of the least friendly items uh, to read. Leave it to the government to take what I think was pretty interesting material and turn it into a telephone book. But uh, so, yeah, I think, I think we're going to work on that. Right, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love Herb's drawings. And when they put it online, when they put the nomination online, they were the things that they, that they omitted, which was sort of, <laughs> you know, the, the, the punchline of showing how all of this came together in a, in a graphic way that's understandable. And they didn't include those in the, in the uh, online form. So... So a little strange. And the other question? How did Fenwick acquire the land and were some of the bogs originally uh, iron mines? Oh, great. Uh, well, so James Fenwick was the cousin to the Jones family who owned the, uh... oh, and I'm not even on, am I? We hear you. There, there you are. <laughs> so, so Fenwick was the uh, cousin to the Joneses. He he had been an orphan. He was brought to uh, New Lisbon, where he lived with his uh, cousins, 
and then they set him up. They were very generous to him, and and he gets Fenwick Manor, and he's you know this up and coming farmer and uh, local gentryman. Uh, his backstory, by the way, is really quite interesting because it's not what I thought it would be. Uh, but then the Joneses own the Hanover Tract, which is considerable. It's uh, 24,000 acres, I believe, included everything. You know, we think 3,000 acres at Whitesbog is a lot of land. That was just a small part of the Hanover Tract. So in 1857, when the cranberry industry starts to show real promise, and that's the decade when cultivating cranberries got big, people learned how to, how to do it and it was making a lot of money. Uh, Fenwick uh, approached the, the Joneses and they gave him Cranberry Run, which as I mentioned earlier, was one of the largest natural uh, cranberry meadows in, in the region. And so, and that's how, uh, by the way, I found that a, a few of these farms started, they would pick existing natural cranberry land and then they would enhance it and expand the cultivated area. Uh, so whether, I guess he purchased it, but I think it was a sweetheart in, insider family deal. And it was fine with them that, that, because at that point, 1857, as you know, these furnaces in the pines were, if they weren't out altogether, they were winding down fast. And so their interest in the Hanover tract was fading. And whether or not Cranberry Run had been exploited for uh, bog war isn't clear. And I, you know, it's something that experts might be able to get at as to where these things were, where the uh, iron ore was occurring. But my guess is that it, it wouldn't have been because it, it would have been too disturbing to the natural cranberry bog. Uh, but I may be wrong. The uh, it, it doesn't occur everywhere. It occurs along streams in some areas where there's a, a concentration of, of iron oxides that, that form it. I'm not an expert in that, but I, I did ask and I did look into it. Uh, what I like to point out is that in general, the Hanover Tract would have been kind of a horror story, you know, with uh, people digging up iron ore and then burning uh, the cordwood to make charcoal. So if you visited there in 1830, you would have seen a landscape being pretty well uh, savaged by uh, burning over, cutting, clear cutting and uh, smoldering charcoal mounds and <laughs> digging up iron ore. Um, but that's what, that's as much as I know. I don't know exactly where they were digging. I, oh, I should say someone uh, indicated, where, where did I find this? North of Hanover, in as you get up near Cookstown, there's an area there, and I'm trying to remember who told me about it, uh, that they said what was extensively mined by Hanover. So th there was there does seem to be some knowledge of some other areas where the mining was was occurring, whether it was primarily up there or not, I don't know. All right, and there was another question asking if this presentation will be linked anywhere else. So it is being recorded right now. And um, eventually I do have a few others to get through before this one, but eventually I will be posting it on YouTube and that will be connected to the website as well. Very good. Uh, all right, any other questions? Okay. We're done. Uh, any final words, Bill? <laughs> uh, no, I do look forward to being able to talk to people in person, but this, this was far less painful than I expected. <laughs> and uh, I hope it came across okay, but uh, yeah. I found it very, uh, very convenient. And yes. uh, my cats were able to sit here with me and <laughs> listen as well. They, I think they learned a lot. Yeah. So. I normally don't bring my cats with me when I give talks. So. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. It was a really interesting talk and we will be working on it. Oop, I
see someone raising your hand. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Saying goodbye. All right. Well, have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Good night. Good night, and thank you.